Aloha, it is Dave Lawrence, and uh, an exciting follow-up interview we get to do here with a cat that has been uh, our recent phone guest on the air, but a guy that we got to sit down with at Hawaiian Brian's five years ago when he was last in town touring from the Yardbirds. He's back, and he's now at the Blue Note, in Blue Note Hawaii in Waikiki doing a three-night run. Jim McCarty, their legendary drummer, original member, and thank you so much for taking some time for us. Pleasure. My pleasure, Dave. It's good to see you again. And I was hoping that you could, uh, I was thinking, uh, we went through some some fascinating history of Jim uh, going back to the earliest days of his life, really, and then stretching forward. And I was trying to fill in the gaps with things that maybe we had not talked about. When you when you think back to um, probably before that military style marching band experience, what was the first thing that you realized, man, I'm, I'm into music. I like music where you realize when you can look back at it, that you were gravitated towards it. Uh well, I used to buy old 78 records, and I used to buy funny old sort of jazz. I think one of the first records I bought was a jazz record called um, Bad Penny Blues. <laughs> and they were all 78s with a funny little dance set player, or whatever it was. And how old about? Well, I was probably 15, 16. Okay. And still hadn't played any drums? Uh, not really, no. Just, okay. just started to get into, into the boys' brigade by then. And so that was it. So you're buying these records, and so there was no rock and roll yet in your life. Not really. We, you know, we listened to BBC Radio, and it was that was pretty um, pretty straightforward. They play a lot of classical music, and um, sort of maybe the, the the top ten, you know, of the, of the era, which was like, you know, they were like ballads and not not really rock and roll stuff. Boys Brigade then was what introduced you to the drums. Yeah, yeah. Boys Brigade. I suddenly got into playing the the snare drum, and I love that. I love that sound. And you're marching with a snare drum. Paint a picture of how you guys come together as an ensemble. <laughs> well, we do. You know, we march down the street with our with our hats on and our uniforms. <laughs> but it was it wasn't a big it wasn't a big uh, group. You know, it was a, probably about twelve of us or something. You know, and and I used to play the snare drum. And then all the other snare drummers used to play the same. I used to, I liked that. Well, I could play the, I play, I play a special thing, and then they'd all play the same. <laughs> and when did you get a kit? I, did, I didn't get a kit until. Um, mm, let me see. I, I saw one advertised in a local paper, and I, I was doing a gig with a sort of school group. I guess I was about seventeen, eighteen, um, and we were going to play down in a holiday camp down in um, Cornwall okay. in England, in the west of England. Um, some sort of unknown, not Butlins or anything like that. And um, so I saw, I saw a kid advertise. I was going to work in the uh, holiday camp, you know, washing up dishes and things. <laughs> and so I knew I was going to make some money. And the kit I saw in the local paper was just consisted of a, a snare drum a bass drum and a hi hat. That was all it was, and it was uh, eleven pounds. Amazing. And I, I borrowed the money from my dad, and I knew I was going to make, you know, probably twenty pounds washing up over a few weeks. And so it was like uh, a, a great accompaniment. And again, this is your sixteen, something like that. Yeah, sixteen, seventeen, maybe. You mentioned your your dad. Um, how how overall looking back, did they factor into the nurturing of what became your career? Were they encouraging of it? Were there specific moments that you can point to that they helped push you or um, encourage you? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. They thought it was kind of crazy. Yeah, they thought it was a bit odd. I mean, they were sort of proud of me when I suddenly appeared on TV and. <laughs> But my dad did die when I was 17, so um, there was only really my mum. And first of all, she hated the idea of me giving up my, my job. You know, I worked in the stock exchange. And she didn't like me giving up because a job in those days was a secure life, you know. So paint that picture. How do you end up, you're a stockbroker on the London Stock Exchange. How did that end up happening? Well, I, I went from school, to advert, you know, there was an advertisement in the paper and I went for it. It seemed, you know, quite good money, I think, at the time. Probably, you know, about £12 a week or something silly. And um, it seemed good. It, 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 it was all about figures. I was always good at figures. 
and then I was studying to be an actuary, you know, the people that work out insurance premiums. Where were you studying? Well, I was studying like on, um, you know, uh, at work and at, um, you know, by a correspondence. And you did this right after, so Hampton School was like a high school kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that was the high school. So this was right after that? Yeah. No college? No college, no. We just went from there. Um, there was a sixth form, so we. I think I left when I was 17. And you actually were doing that during the early years of the Yardbirds, too? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was your day job. You'd be on the. You'd be working as a stockbroker, and then by night, cranking out the tunes with. Yeah, it was a funny, a funny <laughs> mixture. And uh, so often I used to get the train because we were working quite a lot when we started, and uh, I used to get the train from the city out to where the gig was, and then have to change all my clothes. You know. You'd show up all dressed in like a suit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had a bowler hat. I mean. Uh, but I had a suit and an umbrella, you know, and all that. It's great. It's a great. It's a great um, segue into those early years of the band. So at one point, Yardbirds had the privilege of backing. I, I read Sonny Boy Williamson on a European tour. Yeah, we did. We we didn't do really Europe. We did just England. We did about um, maybe half a dozen dates, and we did that recording at the Crawdaddy Club in Richmond. Just in England, nothing on the continent. Yeah, nothing I remember. No, we just just played in England. Did that was that a formative experience for you? Did you feel like a lot of satisfaction getting to actually finally not only be seeing an, a legend and someone whose music you admired but then you're collaborating? Well, it was good. It was good. It was good and it was odd at the same time because really, you know, we we had nothing in common. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> we we were just sort of young guys from the suburbs of London. Kind of like naming yourself after a bunch of hobos in your yeah, suburban yeah, London. Exactly, guy. we we were all white, and this guy was an old <laughs> black dude. <laughs> you know, who lived in Tennessee, and he was he he was miles away from where we were. You know, but um, but at the same time, you know, he he was a great performer. Right, and you loved the music, and yeah, it was yeah. bringing on home uh, Jimmy immortalized with Zeppelin of his years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So it's like when you think about the, the songs and who, who that is. Were there other blues greats that you did that with, or was that the only one? I uh, don't think we played. No, we didn't do uh, gigs with others, but, but like, sometimes they would come and sit in. Like who? Because our manager, Giorgio Gamelski, um, he used to bring them all over. Uh, he was involved in the National Jazz Federation in England, in London, and they would bring over these tours of all these black guys you know every year who do you remember sitting in with or having to sit in with you uh people like you know big joe williams i think he he played with us and maybe um we did a memphis slim but there were there were a couple of other guys that just sat in i think we also we jammed with like buddy guy when we were in chicago you know that was great so that'd be like late, late 60s, 67, I believe, 65? 66, or, yeah. 66, okay. Um, talk about uh, the Graham Goldman song, uh, For Your Love. Introduced to you guys, how does it end up being introduced to you as a song to do? Uh, well, we were playing with the Beatles. Um, we was in, uh, one of their support bands, and they were doing a Christmas show in um, Hammersmith. Hammersmith Odeon. Odeon in London. That's in the southwest of London. And we were the like the local band, and they asked us to play on the bill, which was great, you know. And um, you know, we were playing our set, and there was a guy from a publisher's called Ronnie Beck. He was from a publisher called Feldman in London, and he had, um, you know, he had a demo disc, sort of an acetate disc what they used to do take acetates around in those days like a promo copy yeah a promo and uh like a promo 45 whatever and he 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 contacted our manager Giorgio and Giorgio you know got us up for a meeting we we all listened to it and we liked it and I think the thing when he saw us play he saw us changing rhythms and things and um so he thought for your love was, was a good fit a good fit because they had a rhythm change in the middle. You had mentioned uh, in previous times, it's been a privilege to get to speak with Jim several times in my life uh, and have grown up with the Yardbirds. And previously you've mentioned the the Beatles thing where you guys got to, was, and I just wanted to explore that a little more. Um, was that the only time you guys got to open for them? 
Uh, there was another time in Paris. W- one more time when we played uh, at the Olympia, the Palais des Sports in, okay. in in Paris. Yeah. And um, memories? Anything stick out? Interactions with the Beatles guys? Are they hard to get to? Were they already insulated? What was it like? Well, there were, yeah, there were some memories. I mean. Um, the, the one in Paris was funny because they, they said, oh, well, we're going to use just the one kit. So, you know, if you could use Ringo's kit. <laughs> so I was playing away and, it, I was, and Jeff Beck was playing and he plays pretty loud, you know, and I, so I was batching away. And I got to, the, got to the last number and suddenly the snare drum breaks and I think, oh, no, I've broken Ringo's <laughs> snare. What am I going to do? <laughs> so I was very, very nervous about it. And but they they came, took it, mended it, and Ringo sort of waved his fist at me when he saw me, you know, for a joke. Was that it, the only interaction you guys had with him? Uh, no, at Hammersmith, we we had uh, McCartney came into our dressing room and he he played us um, he played us this new song he'd written and it, he said, oh, I don't have lyrics for it yet, but um, I'm calling it Scrambled Egg at the moment, and he he sang that and. Uh, it was yesterday. Right. And he didn't have the lyrics. Amazing. So just him on an acoustic planet? Yeah, yeah he came and like, here, yeah, sat there. That is, uh, <laughs> were they impressed by the Yardbird? Yeah, yeah, we thought it was great. Wow, what a song, you know. <laughs> but I mean, were they impressed by you guys? Were they like, oh, wow, the Yardbirds, they, they, they're an up and coming? They liked us, yeah. I think they, yeah, they liked us. They liked, um, I think they particularly liked Jeff. I don't know whether they liked Eric, but... Um, so when you did the first gig, it was Eric was still in the band or had he already left when yeah, you did? He, he, he was in the band. Then. Oh, yeah. That was, that was when he walked in late and he missed the, uh, he yeah. walked down. The- <laughs> he walked down with his trench coat. Was it more than one show? So it wasn't, was it several nights and that was just one of them? Yeah, yeah. It was like five nights or something. Because otherwise it'd be a hard memory to have. Yeah, I had this opportunity to open for the Beatles once and I missed it. I was late. <laughs> <laughs> it it might have been two shows a night as well, for all I remember. Okay. Because I was thinking, so he didn't miss his whole opportunity no, to it. No, 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 he was there. Not that he didn't go on and have a huge enough career, but still, it's not something you well, want. Well, he linked up with George, didn't he, after that? So. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. He had enough uh, enough thing there. I read Jeff's first gig, Jeff Beck's first gig, was just two days after Clapton left the band. Do you remember that being a sort of, that That would, to me, I mean, if it was the modern day Yardbirds, you're like, all right, you got to, we got a gig in two days, you got to learn the repertoire. It would seem like it would still be kind of stressful. Yeah, yeah, tricky, very tricky, but... Um, I can't remember. We had a few rehearsals, obviously, and uh, but he was great anyway, so he fitted in very, very easily. Right, and he's a monster guitarist. I'm yeah, sure that's a challenge. He was ready, ready to have. And we played at the 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 first gig was at a gig called Fairfield Hall, which is a big uh, hall in Croydon, which is out southwest of London, about 20 miles from from the centre of London. You remember doing Heart Full of Soul, Shapes of Things. Are there anything that stick out when you were laying? These are formative tunes. We were just checking one out before we came over here. And, and uh, just, I mean, these songs you grow up on, they become the soundtrack to your life. No joke, right? I mean, you're one of those cats who help make the soundtrack to someone's life. When you oh, think about uh, making uh, those yeah, songs. funny, really, isn't it? Well, it was just part of our uh, part of our growth, you know. Started with For Your Love and then um, Heart Full was another song by Graham. And then, actually, Giorgio was good because he said, oh, you're, you're sitting around in dressing rooms and traveling. Why don't you write songs? Because you can make publishing. Right. Because we didn't know anything about it, you know. And then we started to write, and we did, like, Still I'm Sad and Shapes of Things. And did you ever hear Rainbow cover Still I'm Sad in the, in the 70s? Yeah, yeah. They do that incredible guitar yeah, and cozy pound and drum. <laughs> yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. With Ronnie James Dio. Oh, right, yeah. I did. Yeah. It was incredible when they would do that. That's one, That's really, Jim, how I got introduced to the Yardbirds. Oh, oh okay. From Rainbow doing yeah. it. And I was like, wow, I got to get into this band because this tune is smoking. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when we think about uh, Train Kept a Rolling, same thing. Was that, do, do you, what did it, I mean, I know that you guys didn't write it. It had, it had been written and then been reinterpreted once by like a 50s rocker. Then it yeah. ends up in your yeah. in your shoes. Well, that was Jeff's idea. That was what he brought in to the band. He, he always liked that song. And uh, we tried it out. And uh, I thought this was, you know, this is a little bit different. But, it, but it's good, you know. It's, it's a sort of bluesy rockabilly thing. 
I bet with Johnny A in the band these days, you must have m- talked about Aerosmith's cover of that at some uh, point. Yeah, yeah, we did. And yeah. They turned it into such an epic. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Radio Crazy. jam. Crazy. When you think about that first U.S. tour, that was the f- first time you got to the U.S. It was during Beck's tenure with the group. It was sixty-five. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Any memories of that? I mean, some of the some of the dates included uh, venues that would you'd end up doing things with the legendary Bill Graham. Uh, I think the very very first tour we had trouble with our visas, and uh, th- so we only played a couple of kit. And we we were doing TV. We did TV in New York. Um, I can't remember what it was now, but so we we managed to do the TV, and then we did a couple of gigs. Then the visas wore out. Well, the visas suddenly we were aware we didn't have proper visas, <laughs> and so we played some mad party in in LA. With all these, you know, all these film stars were supposed to have come, and there was lots of stories about it all. Um, but it, that that was good as a promo, you know, one of Giorgio's ideas. Anything, and no, no memory of that of any of those stars that stick out. Well, they were saying, oh, Brando was there and Bob Dylan, but, but you didn't. I, I, I didn't see them. <laughs> sixty-seven, July of sixty-seven in San Francisco, you played the Fillmore on the same bill with the Doors. Any interactions with Jim Morrison? Ah, uh, n- no. Did, well, we were on the same bill, were we? Yep. All oh, right. Okay. July sixty-seven. I was doing my homework. I always thought they were great. I thought they they were great. And um, the only time we ever saw. Jim Morrison was in the scene club in New York and he he suddenly jumped on stage and he was completely drunk out of his head. <laughs> During one of your sets? No, no, we weren't playing. We were just hanging out, you know. And he jumped up on stage. Yeah, and Whoever the band was, he jumped up and he was all drunk and he had to be <laughs> taken out. <laughs> those are good. Uh, those are very good memories. Um, and uh, Jimmy Page, can you, can you think about, we, we didn't really talk about any highlights from his era with the band. You did the blow up movie shooting with him. Yeah. Are there other things that stick out about getting to have wh- a guy who would, you know, end up making this, this monster band, the new yard birds, Led yeah. Zeppelin. Yes. Well, he was always very, um, very businesslike as far as we were concerned. You know, he, he came from playing sessions um, you know, and he was always very keen on doing what we wanted, and he was always trying to fit in and please the client. Yeah, we were the yeah. We, you guys were the client, yeah, and he yeah, was yeah, just... yeah, and he he was very helpful, and um, he, he I suppose he developed that later on. You know, as he got into Zeppelin and stuff, uh, he developed the monster, the the monster image, but. Um, right. But he was different when you guys. He was mellow. He was very nice and polite and very quiet. And did you stay in touch with him when after the Yardbirds or no? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, in fact, I've got to see him soon because uh, we got some old recordings that might come out with him. And you're going to do a little. So what would that be? Something from the vaults? Yeah, the, the it's actually the Anderson Theatre. You know the 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 record that got withdrawn that got recorded in '68. That might be coming out. So that might be, yeah, he's, he's remixed it all. Are there other things in the vaults that you've held on to all these years or have all the studio things been released? No, they're all out now. Yeah. No. Do, you, do, you, do you sometimes wish that you had held back on some of that stuff, seeing that, the, or, or, or now, is it just so far into the future where everything's just a free download that it's not even worth having yeah, held on yeah, to? Yeah, well, in some ways, but I think, you know, our stuff would be, it would be nice if we had some more, I agree. But, um, you know, there, w- there was never really any live stuff with Jeff and Jimmy, which would have been... Well, that that would have been nice. Yeah, that would have been nice. Well, when we think about Jimmy uh, as a final sort of thing, I'd never really asked about Peter Grant. Peter Grant would go on to be, when, when it comes to managers, that would be one of the most infamous rock managers of all times. But it, but it could be a situation that, it, much like with Jimmy, when you got to interact with him, he was he was mellower. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, he, he was uh, like a... He was a tour manager before us, and then he, he, you know, he was very gentlemanly and he used to come to gigs, and he was always very helpful. And any story with him that sticks out? Uh, well, we got, we got, we got, we had this gig once, and we were playing, um, I think, upstate New York somewhere, and we we used to travel around on a Greyhound bus. You know, we hired a, a Greyhound bus, and. Uh, we had to drive all the way through the night and we got to this this venue and it was an outdoor 
festival and it was run by these two brothers you know these two sort of mafia types and we got to the well, we were all tired you know we've been in this bus all night and we we said okay well now we're at the, the venue but we're just going to go to the hotel and have a shower you know because we've we've been up all night and uh the guy said oh no you're you're not going to leave here because uh we're going to shoot your tires if you try and leave we just want to have a shower <laughs> and so peter grant, so peter grant said oh well, you're going to shoot us are you <laughs> <laughs> it's like this big guy right <laughs> you get an image of what's to come <laughs> yeah the future peter us. grant <laughs> oh you're gonna fucking shoot us <laughs> but um funny enough the guy working with us tonight the tour manager he he was the he was our tour manager then wow and he worked for zeppelin and he saw all that craziness yeah he saw he worked for zeppelin for quite a few years and then aerosmith so Jesus. And he's here tonight. Well, well, I mean, that's a... Uh, oh, I would expect Henry, you to be yeah, in good company. What's Henry, that? Henry, you know Henry. Henry... Henry Smith. Oh, the tour manager. Yeah, yeah. That's the guy. Yeah, that's him. Wow. He's looking good. Henry the horse. Is that what... <laughs> the stories that he's got. Huh? Yeah, yeah, he's got some stories. I can only imagine. You've been very generous with your time, uh, and and I hope that there's going to be a uh, another tour that brings you back to the islands. I do hope you remember. I asked you on the phone to say uh, send my very best to Chris Drea, um, yeah. who yeah. I've who I've thought about. I miss not having him here tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah I did. I, I did, and I will do again. Okay. You've already talked to him. Yeah, I, d I just speak to him now and then. Yeah, that's good. Um, and, and he can speak okay. He still yeah, he can talk okay. Yeah. He's a bit slow. He's, he sounds like he's a bit drunk all the time. Is he in London? Yeah. All right. He have family to take care of him and stuff. Uh, he's got he's got a girlfriend, but he's got a daughter who lives in Baltimore. Wow. Yeah, I gave him lots of love. We definitely. Uh, it was fun getting to hang with you guys last time. It was great to see you again. You're looking great, and I'm looking forward to hearing you. And, and God bless. Thank you so much, Jim McCarty, Yardbirds legendary drummer. Hope you had fun today. Thank you. Thank you very much.